On October 21, 1936, the Hawaii Clipper left San Francisco with the first paying airline passengers ever to cross the Pacific. The Clipper was under the command of Edwin Music, with the future Pan Am chairman Harold Grave serving as the first officer and Fred Noonan as navigator. Upon arrival of the Hawaii Clipper in Honolulu on October 22, 1936, a ceremony was held to christen the new Clipper. Patricia Kennedy christens the Hawaiian Clipper with coconut water in 1936. The fare to Manila was $950 and ticket number one was sold to R.F. Bradley, the aviation manager for Standard Oil. Other passengers were famous first flighter Carla Adams, May Department Store Executive Wilbur May, Aviation Executive Alfred Bennett, who disembarked in Hawaii, Tobacco and Transportation Hare Thomas Fortune Ryan III, one of the owners of the Lockheed Aircraft Company. Edward B. Breyer, who was chief engineer of the Hawaiian Dredging Company, made the trip from Honolulu to Manila and return on the inaugural passenger flight of the Trans-Pacific Route of the Pan American Airway System. Returning to Honolulu on November 2nd, he gave an interesting description of his experiences before a large gathering of the Engineering Association of Hawaii on Friday noon, November 13th. This narration was from a paper that was prepared for the alumni of Occidental College, Los Angeles, of which Mr. Breyer is a graduate. It was my privilege to make a trip to Manila and back to Honolulu on the Hawaii Clipper. We left Honolulu before dawn on the 23rd of October on the way to the airport at Pearl City, which is situated at the point of a peninsula projecting into Pearl Harbor. Although it was nearly two hours before time to take off for Midway, a crowd was gathering to bid farewell. Since this first day's hop is the only part of the course where islands are seen, it makes more interesting listening. I therefore invite you to come along with me. We climbed down into the roomy cabin, fastened the clasp of our safety belts, and for some ten minutes taxi on the smooth face of Pearl Harbor in order to warm up those four powerful engines that are to whisk this 25-ton bird to Midway Island. All is ready and we face the barely perceptible morning breath off the Kohahau Lao Range. At 6.55 a.m. Captain Music opens up the throttle and we surge forward. For what seems like minutes we are dashing past half of Ford Island. We lighten a little and now and then the stub wings no longer touch the water and above the engine roar comes the deadened sound of a thick spray beating up against the floor. Again we're in the water, and then out a second, with increasing frequency until we seem almost entirely free, only to touch again, and again, but with less frequency and with more confidence. The strain of parting is over. We exchange a few last tags, as it were, with the smooth surface beneath, and take a deep breath, only to have that feeling that we cannot get away from the water and are about to land once more. During this period of apparent indecision, although we have not sensed it just yet, we are gaining a little altitude and a great deal of momentum. The next move comes with an awakening suddenness as we swerve up and begin the long climb out of the harbor. Rapidly our horizon enlarges. We bank and revolve to the left, cross above the airport and over West Lock towards Barber's Point. Below are the clean, contrasting colors of a plantation camp. With pardonable pride, I am wondering where else but in Hawaii are such neat, well-ordered homes. We study the ammunition depot at West Lock, stretching out like an architect's watercolor in the morning light. Soon we are past Kapolei, with its rifles silently pointing in different directions, and glimpse the Luluale radio towers, and the several prominent craters along the Waianae shore. 
We see through Koli Koli Pass the fields on the plain below, but all the time we are rapidly drawing away from Oahu out into the channel, which is 65 miles in the clear between the headlands of Oahu and Kauai. Now we can pay more attention to the ocean floor, the cloud forms around and above, and to the connecting veils of the rain painting with attractive rainbows. Little do we realize that for hours on end there will be little else to study, and yet always in new combinations presenting itself. We've been up 49 minutes and are opposite Port Allen with its new breakwater, the nearest point of Kauai that we approach. Five minutes later we see Nihiao, a very low flat plain with beaches of coral sand, but in the central part a plateau raises abruptly, the surrounding poly forming protection from all sides. Just offshore is Liha, a perfect crescent, being the rim of a volcano, half submerged, with one half missing. We see no beaches outside, but the waves breaking on an inner beach between the horns form an interesting contrast with the dark color of Liha. Poor visibility prevents sighting Kalu Rock, southwest of Nihiao, 19 miles. Looking back to Kauai at the long stretch of barking sands where the Southern Cross, Kingsford Smith, took off for Sulva and beyond the Nepali section of the island. It is 8 a.m. We are up an hour. The navigator Noonan forces open against the airstream one of the two hinged windows that form emergency exits from the lounge tosses out a flask of thin glass filled with powdered aluminum. From the stopper projects the double fins found on bombs and on arrows. Seconds later it crashes and forms a silver reference mark on the sea below. Skillfully observing this through a telescope-like instrument mounted on a bracket just outside the windowsill, our navigator makes notes and returns to his compass and clock in the chart room which lies beyond us and the cockpit. Before long, we will learn that at least once each hour, this and many other observations are made in order that a perfect up-to-the-minute record of our course through space may be plotted on the boards at Alameda, Pearl Harbor, and Midway. This is accomplished via constant two-way radio communication, plane to shore. It's 9.04 o'clock and Nihoa, or Bird Island, is a beam, distant about 10 miles. We are still flying low and get an excellent profile of the island, which raises steeply from the sea to attain a height of 900 feet, only to dive precipitously along its west and north borders into the white breakers. We cannot distinguish its valleys, prehistoric ruins, nor its bird life. Ever since sighting Kauai, we have been ducking around rain squalls and gently bumping our way through those misty veils hanging from the cloud ceiling, which almost touches our wings. The motion has been steadily slackening until now. We are only gently tossed by a variable gusty tailwind. It is 9.30 o'clock and we are 2,700 feet above the ocean, 350 miles from Pearl Harbor climbing up through the clouds until we are well above them. Here all motion ceases and we breathe a cooler, rarer air. From this eminence the seafloor has become very tame, moving back almost imperceptibly as we drone out the miles. It has become just a surface to reflect the lights of sun and sky where the endless variety of cloud forms can lay down their shadows in imprints just as endless in variety. As we turn our gaze from the peaceful plain below, covered with tiny flicks of light, to its more distant parts, we actually see it dissolving into a light blue haze, exactly matching the sky. The horizon we have always known does not exist here, and we are living in a delightfully detached sphere of light, color, and shadow. At 10.17 o'clock, we pass nearly over Nicker, just a tiny rock ridge curled up on the floor below, with white breakers about halfway in. Every half hour to hour, 
we reach in succession French frigate shoals. Gardner peninsulas. Morrow Reef. and Laysan Island. Pearl and Hermes Reef is directly abeam at 2.30 p.m. A coral atoll enclosing a lagoon of shallow water in tints of green and containing several tiny sand inlets. We sight Midway at 3.35 p.m. and after passing over it come about into the wind, slide gracefully over the reef onto the still water inside, landing at 3.40 p.m. After being in the air 8 hours 44 minutes, just 1,309 miles from the Pearl Harbor, the first day of flying is finished. We taxi over to a tiny barge and nose up into a sloping apron covered with tire casings. There are no customs nor immigration officials to meet us. Just enough men are there to secure the ship and make a thorough inspection of every vital mechanical feature of the plane. Some minor adjustments will be made. Fuel and oil will be replenished until late that night we may, but actually do not, hear the engines running again in a final test. We forget the air for the present. It is a pleasure to get into a sturdy little launch and a few minutes later land at a light pier used for passengers and baggage. Midway Island boasts two station wagons. The roads are not paved, but the coral sand packs well under light traffic. We go in these machines to the new Pan Air Hotel, accommodating 50 guests. The accommodations are similar on Midway, Wake, and Guam. Chamorro boys from Guam are used at all three places. They are generally much like the Hawaiian, having a dignified and friendly attitude towards all. It was strange to one who knows the Chinese to learn that for some reason it became necessary to replace the Chinese boys originally brought to Midway and Wake. For 30 years, the station of the Commercial Pacific Cable Company has been the only activity at Midway. We visit their station and find it surrounded with ironwood, evergreen trees, 60 to 80 feet in height. Wild canaries are everywhere, as well as other interesting birds. The goonies have not arrived, but moaning birds fill the night with their human noises. We swim, have an excellent dinner, listen to the radio, and retire early.